I wish I could um, crank this up <laughs> through my Marshall, but uh, yeah, it's late. I couldn't sleep, and um, so I thought I'd just make uh, a video to pay a tribute to a friend of mine, Paul Matters, who passed away just this last week. He was a friend of mine, I wouldn't say one of those great friends, but the kind that you run into every now and again, and you pick up where you left off, <laughs> and for me it was, you know, over a period of uh, 40 years since I, I first met him, I think it was 1979, so just over 40 years. And uh, this guitar I bought from uh, Muso's Corner, it used to be called Foley's Music, there in uh, 1981 I think I bought it, and I got to know Steve Cowley back in those days. He, uh, as you'll later find out, uh, played in a band with Paul Matters called Armageddon and I had an interesting catch-up with Paul Matters in 1981 that I'll share a little bit later. <laughs> Not about this guitar, but it's just interesting that this actual guitar was there that year, and uh, this encounter I had with Paul was that year as well. So I'm not, you know, this is not planned, I don't have anything set out, but I'm just one voice of a lot of people that appreciated him in this part of the world which is, uh, we're about, I guess, uh, an hour and a half from the centre of Sydney. And uh, I live in a small town about 20 minutes south of where Paul Matters spent most of his life living, a town called Toronto, on the shores of Lake Macquarie. And uh, there, there are people who could speak more knowledgeably of Paul Matters. Uh, I think of Rod Westcombe, who I think was the first to really announce the passing of Paul last week, and he knew uh, Paul, I think, at least since uh, 1973. But anyway, Paul's claim to fame was uh, that he spent some time playing bass for ACDC. And I just thought it would be appropriate to share some memories of Paul because there's not a lot out there on the on the uh, internet and like I say we were friends wouldn't say close friends but we shared you know a few key moments throughout our lives and had some very interesting conversations and so I thought I'd um, just share some of them to make this information available and to flesh out a little bit about his his uh, his life I guess um, but to encourage more people to do the same there's a lot of people that will have known Paul he was a little bit reclusive but uh, again these are my memories they might be wrong dates might be a little bit out <laughs> um, you know, I'm a muso, we, f we forget things. But, um, yeah, overall, I just want to, I guess, stimulate some conversation about Paul. And a, a really interesting <clears throat> kind of moment that happened to me this time last week. So right now, it's a Sunday night, 
and it's raining outside. <laughs> the sky is crying for Paul. But I had an interesting moment this time last Sunday night where uh, I went into Toronto and um, we'd had some dinner with some friends there at uh, the Toronto Workers Club. And as, as we were coming home, I stopped at the petrol station. And as I was leaving, so talk about a literal sliding door moment, um, Paul was coming in to the petrol station. Um, and this is, the kind, this, this is an old photo of him, which I think I've just borrowed from uh, perhaps Rod's page. Uh, it's not very clear. Come on, focus in there for me. Um, <laughs> I didn't think this th through too well, did I? It's a little bit out of focus there, but you can see that kind of cheeky grin. A twinkle in his eye, slightly bad boy look, cheeky grin. And he was coming in to the petrol station as I was literally going out through the sliding door. Now an interesting thing, a little aside there, he, um, I'm pretty sure his father used to own that petrol station years ago. Uh, if someone could confirm that in the comments, that'd be great. I'm pretty sure that his father owned that very petrol station many years ago. So he was probably coming in for a snack or, I don't know, because outside, I noticed later he had his um, a, a, one of those scooters, like a kind of a old person <laughs> scooter. Um, I'm 58 at the moment, and he must have been, I don't know, um, five, ten years older than me. He looked a little bit overweight. He looked a little bit kind of um, jaded. But outside was his um, s mobility scooter, I guess. And um, it had bags on it. And to be honest, I, I felt like he was looking a little bit homeless, even though I know he wasn't. That's his hometown there, Toronto. And as he came out, as he was coming in, uh, our eyes connected, and that look I just showed you, that little smile, that twinkle in his eye, that little bad boy um, grin was just there, like it has always been. And he and I smiled at each other, acknowledged each other, but my wife and two little girls were in the car, it was late, and... I knew I just had to keep going. Now, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, or at least a year, and I was torn. I wanted to stop. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to say, mate, how you going? What are you up to? Let's catch up for a coffee or something. And he had that moment where he just paused for a second, and I paused for a second, and, and we kind of just kept going. You know, it gave each other a little acknowledgement and kept going. And as I went to the car, I saw the mobility scooter and I hopped in the car and I, and I said to my wife, I said, that, that was Paul Matters. I haven't seen him for a while, but he was the bass player for ACDC in 1975. And um, I even said to her then, I, I should have stopped and chatted to him, but, you know, we've got to get home. The girls are tired. My little girls are only six and seven. So anyway, a couple of days later, uh, a friend of mine, Chris Wind, local uh, muso guy, great guy, he sends me a message and I think it might have even been um, uh, from Rod Westcombe's Facebook page and he said, Paul Matters is dead. I said, no way, I, I literally just saw him a couple of nights ago, it, it can't be. And and uh, he said, oh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, there's not much out there on, online about it, but I'm pretty sure he is. And, uh, yeah, he, he, a few hours later, sent me some uh, other clippings and a, uh, I think a write-up in Channel 7, on Channel 7 News. And I then uh, went and looked at Rod Westcombe's page. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Rod. I don't think we've actually met each other 
that I know of, Rod. Um, and 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 I read the the post that he'd put on there, and I just felt really sad. You know, one of those moments where I I'll I'll never have that opportunity again to just have a conversation with Paul. We will never have that chance to just pick up where we left off and talk about music and this kind of thing. So I felt sad that he'd passed. And in many ways he lived, as I said earlier, a, rec a reclusive kind of life. And he, he, he had humor and buoyant, a buoyant personality. And I guess in many ways you just knew not to talk too much about the ACDC um, era. It had impacted him and hurt him. It's hard to explain because he'd also he had moved on as well. He wasn't like a victim or lamenting or crying in a corner or anything like that. But he, it, you could just tell it was a topic that was you know, not too comfortable for him to talk about. And I don't know if others have felt that as well. I'd be interested to chat with Rod about his thoughts because he he knows Paul much, much better than, than I ever did for a longer period of time as well. And I think they even played in in, in a band together. And uh, Paul and I almost <laughs> played in two bands. Uh, and I'll share that a little bit later. Um, yeah, so... I had that moment, that sliding door moment, finding out from Chris a few days later that he's passed. And I, I just started reflecting, you know, on, on the times that he and I had crossed paths. And I want to share some of those little key moments. There's some really interesting short stories to tell about Paul. And again, I apologize if my dates are a bit wrong or some of the stories are a bit wrong I've already seen a, a little bit of stuff online that it differs to some things he told me that he has told other people and so either I heard wrong and other people have heard wrong or Paul may have even misremembered is that a word <laughs> but again the key thing is I'm just wanting to share my memories my stories as a tribute to Paul and in, in the hope of encouraging others to who knew him to, to share some stories. So I first remember um, meeting Paul in 1979. Now the town that I kind of grew up in most of my life, I've spent most of my life in this town, is a little town called Kurenbong. And as I said, we're 20 minutes south of uh, Toronto where Paul uh, has been living and I think has lived on and off most of his life. And the Kurenbong community, particularly back then, had a high number of Seventh-day Adventists in the community. Now, I've left the Seventh-day Adventist church, but I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. And in 1979, whispers around us young musos <laughs> who uh, would always get into trouble for our long hair and, and playing rock music... <laughs> by you know by the local church people um i remember word getting around that a former bass player of acdc was going to be in church that week and was interested in seventh day adventism now i don't know if um paul um had some adventist history other people can share that i don't know if he was Maybe his mother was an Adventist or a grandparent. I don't know. I remember talking to him years later, and there seemed to have been some history there, but I'm not sure what it was. Excuse me. As I said, I'm just doing this <laughs> off the top of my head. <clears throat> there won't be any flash edits or anything. So anyway, uh, a few of us were quite excited about that. And I remember a friend of mine, Mark Menzies, and another friend of mine, Brett Ellum, um, 
I think even Glenn Lowe, another friend of mine, we were all quite excited about this because we loved music and we loved ACDC. So anyway, the day came, the next Saturday, Adventist worship on the, on the Saturday. They go to church on Saturday. Uh, sure enough, there he was sitting in one of the pews. And we'd seen pictures of him because there's a famous picture that I later got a copy of, actually, from Don Ayres, who was a, uh, a, a, a um, local businessman. Um, he owned the real estate uh, agency next to my music shop which is another story that I'll share later because Paul used to come and hang out in my shop um, but this is a this is a picture taken of the the poster that Don Ayres I think he'd given he had two and gave me a copy if Don ever watches this he might be able to clarify that but uh, here's another picture of that poster and uh, I wish I'd thought this through more with just getting better quality images. I don't know, maybe there's copyright. I wouldn't be able to do it anyway. But there's Paul up the top there. And you can see, uh, of course, Phil Rudd down the bottom. And Bon Scott, Angus, I think I said Malcolm. And there's uh, Paul leaning in. If you look carefully, you can see that little grin there, the twinkle in his eye. And... Uh, so yeah, we'd we'd seen that that poster. Um, Paul later told me that he um, was set to do a countdown episode, and I think may have gone to a rehearsal for it. I'm not sure. That that's one that someone else will have to confirm or deny but I do remember him talking about that poster and it had something to do with some promotion that they were about to do I think with Countdown could be wrong but anyway us young fellas you know five or six five ten years younger than Paul were super excited that day to see him we recognized him sitting in one of the pews and of course straight after church we made a beeline for him and there would have been six or seven of us huddled around him and you know not oh, i'm i'm been embarrassed by it now but we immediately were asking him for question asking him questions about his time with acdc <clears throat> and i remember him feeling it being very friendly warm kind to us he was obviously a very intelligent deep kind of guy but he he'd had some um I think issues that kept rising later, some health issues due to perhaps some rock and roll lifestyle kind of um, uh, scenarios that played out with drugs and whatnot. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I've heard that you know people say the, the rock and roll lifestyle kind of um, affected him, and I think later it. it it showed that it, it there was some deterioration in his health that I even noticed in the uh, 2000s as well. So he was kind of a little bit over the rock and roll scene and he was kind of wanting to make a fresh start and it, it seemed that he wanted to explore Adventism. So he was more excited about doing that. But anyway, when, when we said, oh, you know, we, we've got a band and everything and uh, made jokes that we needed a bass player, um, and I hope Mark and uh, Brett, who hopefully see this later, remember this, because he agreed, Paul agreed, and I can't remember if it was that day or if it was the next day, to come and check out the band. My memory is it was that day, and we went over to Mark Menzies' place, and Paul might have hung out for lunch. But anyway, I do remember Mark, uh, I think I was playing guitar or maybe even drums Brett was playing guitar for sure and Mark might have been playing some piano and uh, so I just vividly remember us sitting there they had a big music studio downstairs and Paul was sitting in a little armchair off to the side 
And he just sat there. He said, well, play me your stuff. So away we went and, uh, you know, rocketed up with all our <laughs> original songs. And, um, yeah, and he, I just remember this long pause after he's sitting there and he's thinking and he said, you guys are really good. Um, I'd even consider jamming with you guys. But I feel that if you go down this path of rock music, it's going to destroy your life. And so, I, you know, I've given up playing music, he said. And so we, th uh, we said thanks for listening to us and we had a you know, chat later, went on for ages just chatting to him and stuff and I don't remember uh, much else of that. So anyway, um, that was 1979. It really kind of drifted uh, apart after that for, for a, a year or two. And then in 1981, pretty sure Back in Black had come out in 1980. And I'm pretty sure in February of 1981, they played in Sydney. Did a, sh did a Back in Black show in Sydney. Now, all my friends went to that show, but I didn't go because uh, at that time, part of the religion was that you, you can't go um, and do worldly kind of secular, was the word they used, stuff, on the Sabbath, and they counted that as Friday night, and this was on a Friday night. So they would go Friday night to Saturday sunset. So, um, yeah, I'm, I missed out going, but I remember, I think Brett went, I think um, Kevin Finch went, <laughs> and I remember them talking about it at school. So 1979, I would have been in year year uh, 10, maybe? No, year 11? Yeah, year 11. And I remember them talking about it at school and just wishing I could have gone, just wishing I could have gone. And by all accounts, it was a fantastic um, show. But anyway, um, uh, it was before I'd started that year studying in 81 now. So 81, 1980, I'd done uh, year 12. 81's come along, they've just, ACDC have just played in February 81, and I was about to start studying at the local university college. And I'm driving up the, the college drive there, and in my old uh, Holden EH Holden station wagon, and there walking up the road was Paul Matters. He had a way of kind of back then walking quite sprightly, he had a bit of a swagger. He was looking good, his hair was good, he looked happy. Um, and I pulled over and wound down the window and called out, Paul, how are you going? And he said, Peter, hi, how are you? And I thought, wow, he, he remembers me. And um, he said, oh, can you give me a lift? So I'm going into Toronto for a jam session. So anyway, he hopped in the car, and uh, just he and I, I just ended up going, yeah, no worries, <laughs> and I drove him into Toronto. Now, while we were going there, he, this is the first time I kind of noticed him being interested in getting back into rock and roll, and he seemed both um, not sad, but uh, uh, reflective, regretful, um, not envious or jealous, none of that, but he he knew that Back in Black was just going like nuts. So any normal person who's been in a, a band that's gone on to huge fame and you haven't gone along with it because you've been, you've left the band, uh, or you've been kicked out of the band in his case, um, you know, you're going to feel some angst in there or something. But he, he was also he, he had that on board, but he also felt really quite excited 
because where I was taking him was to some kind of jam session. Now, it'd be interesting to chat to Rod uh, Westcombe later. Maybe we went to his house. Maybe Rod was playing, because I remember going somewhere in Toronto and um, sitting in the corner, and Paul played bass. There was a drummer, guitarist, singer, and, boy, they sounded fantastic. Really, really great. So there was this, on the one hand, Paul was kind of a little bit angst-ridden with the, the, the fact that the band he'd been in had gone on to huge fame very soon after him and even, you know, monumental fame with the release of Back in Black. So he had that kind of, um, seemed like annoyance, but he had this passion again playing with this new band he was getting off the ground. So I sat there all afternoon and just listened to this great band and all the songs they were working on, and it was fabulous, really great band. So I'd love if Rod is watching this and could share some uh, information about that. That, was, uh, that's, that would be great. So again, lost touch um, with, with Paul. Uh, yeah, definitely cross paths with him over the next two or three years, but I was uh, flat out studying and surfing <laughs> and playing music myself. Um, you know, I just kind of, you know, and buying this guitar in 1981. And so I, you know, I was busy and like I said, we'd occasionally cross paths and pick up where we left off, have a good conversation. And we had a few of those over the next few years, every now and again. But it wasn't until um, I'd come back from New Zealand. I went and lived in New Zealand from 1986 to uh, in, uh, halfway through 89. Um, kind of found my way back into the, the music scene here between uh, Gosford and Nelson Bay, I guess. And the music industry had changed a lot since I'd been away for all sorts of reasons. There'd been a recession, I think, in 87. Uh, drum machines were taking over. A lot of duo work was happening. Um, uh, drink driving laws were stricter, which is good. But there was a decline, I noticed, in the early 90s of live music in this area. And interestingly, I started a music shop in Kurumbong, uh June 1993. Interesting to kind of start a music shop when really I guess music shops over the next 10 years started to decline. But I mainly wanted it to be a place where I could just hang out during the week and talk to other musos and then do gigs on the weekends really. That's that's why I did it. And and this is where Paul Matters re-enters into my life on a more regular basis. He had he'd given up notions of joining um, churches. He'd lost his his real passion for playing music. I don't really know what happened from 81 to 91. Um, did he play in bands? Did he become discouraged? Did things not take off like he'd hoped? Um, and it was interesting, he started talking a little bit about Armageddon. Armageddon. <laughs> Armageddon. Is that right? Armageddon, which which kind of also made me think that he had had some previous Seventh-day Adventist um, connection because he said he'd come up with that name and Armageddon is kind of an end of times, book of revelation kind of word and um, the violence of the end days and stuff. And so there might be a little truth in that as well. And just an aside there, Steve Cowley, as I said earlier, was in Armageddon. And I tell you what, I I remember jamming with Steve in the in the nine mid nineties maybe. Um, they had a recording studio, and we had a, a jam session. <laughs> and I had a list of, you know, I had a little book that I would write in when something that I felt was a incredibly amazing moment. And um, I would write in my little book, so I'd just be able to look back on it later and go, you know. And I remember writing in my book, Jammed with Steve Cowley. <laughs> uh, 
absolutely incredible guitarist. So yeah, he, he'd know a lot more about um, uh, Paul Matters as well, I'm sure. And maybe he can, you know, contribute some thoughts to the conversation down the track. Um, so anyway, Paul had come back into my life. He'd come and hang out into the shop every now and again. He'd maybe have a jam on one of the bases hanging up. We we didn't really jam. We didn't talk really about music. He didn't talk. My memory of the 90s was him not really talking about ACDC, about music. We just kind of would hang out in the shop, really. And, um, yeah, had some great conversations with him. Again, time goes by, lose touch a little bit. Now, this is where my memory's a little bit hazy. Um, I, I thought around 2006, maybe, I'd love some people to correct me here, that there was a something going on in Western Australia with a, a Bon Scott tribute festival happening or something. Now, I know they've had recent ones. I don't know if there was a regular yearly one. I don't, I don't know <clears throat> much about it, but I know that Paul came into the shop one day and it was around this time that Don Ayres gave me or showed me this poster. I'm assuming he gave it to me because <laughs> I've got it somewhere here. Um, and was talking about Paul Matters and he'd somehow crossed paths with Paul and Paul had been talking about ACDC again and excited about music and he didn't really know that I knew Paul and he said, oh, you should meet up with this guy and he used to be in ACDC, I think you'd really hear. And I said, yeah, I know Paul. And anyway, um, Paul started coming back into the shop. I'm thinking 2005, 2006. This is an interesting little moment because he came in to the shop and said that festival organisers from this Bon Scott tribute program in Western Australia had approached him to put a band together and do a 45, 50 minute slot in the festival. Now I, I kind of thought, ah right, okay, um, that sounds great, good on you, good luck with that, I think you'll have a great time. That would be fantastic. And he seemed really energised and excited. And, and he said, would you like to uh, maybe pull something together with me? I, I've lost touch a bit with the local musos and we get on well and why not? Let's, let's have fun. Let's go to Western Australia, do a 45-minute gig. And I was like, yep, I think that went in my book just <laughs> under jamming with Steve Cowley. Um, you know, Paul Matters just asked if I'd like to kind of get a bit of a band together and play at a Bon Scott tribute festival. So I was in and excited. And I remember contacting um, my friend Ben Dalton, and he was good friends with another guy who's also now a friend of mine, Dan Spillane. Now Dan, and I might be wrong with the dates here again, had I think come um, fourth or fifth in Australian Idol. Um, uh, maybe I should even check my phone and check some of these details as I go. I've, 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 I've taken a few screenshots, so I'll just refer to that in a minute just to maybe check <laughs> I've covered that right. And I remember watching Dan Spillane on the show doing a version of TNT. So he, he, when I spoke to Ben, he knew Dan. We talked about TNT, and we... Um, spoke on the phone and then arranged a catch-up to talk about it in Sydney. And I remember walking down Darling Harbour by the water there and Dan had just recently, the show had just recently finished, I think in 2005, season three. People can fact-check that for me. And everyone was looking at him. It was like he'd walk by and it was like, wow, this, a lot of people must watch that show. And, uh, you know, a few people would wave and smile and say, hi, Dan, and this sort of stuff. So in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, this, this would be great. We have Dan singing, a couple of ACDC covers. We'll have um, Paul Matters on bass. Ben and I will play a bit of guitar. And then I thought, let's ask 
another former ACDC musician to join as drummer, and this is Noel Taylor. Now, I'd known Noel for quite a few years, and he d still lives in the area here. And he had played with ACDC, uh, 73, 74, maybe, he and another bass player. And it'd um, be great to chat to him about this, too. This I, I don't know if he ever met Paul, but I'll tell you what, he is a terrific drummer to this day. And uh, interestingly, also has ties to... <laughs> Of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, um, yeah. So anyway, um, I can't remember, Noel, if you watch this, if we actually had a conversation about this. The first step really was um, to um, have a, a bit of a jam. Now, I, before I just finish this story, I want to just talk about. Two other stories that are coming up. One is what Paul told me about why he left the band. And it, it's different to some other people's stories about it. And I want to talk a little bit about that and maybe why. Um, and um, I just want to quickly show you the album that he just missed out on being on which of course was um, high voltage. Will the camera get into that? You all know what the cover looks like anyway. There's a bit of a shot of it there. And I'll just, I want to just share a little bit about that. I mean, it had, it's a long way to the top on it. The Jack, Livewire, TNT, um, high voltage, of course. And there's a, a little aside that I just want to share about that. Um, he told me, because people say that he did not play any bass on that album. So this could be a little bit murky, because when I had a conversation with him in this time period where we were practicing and talking a lot about this festival in Western Australia, this is where he started to really open up about his time in ACDC, which was a very short period of time. Three to six months, maybe, in 1975, I think. And High Voltage came out in 1976, I think. Um, and he might have been talking about some pre-production work, but my memory of what he said to me is that he did play on one or two of the tracks but when he was unceremoniously kicked out of the band um, that George Young did um, the, redid the bass for those one or two songs and of course as we all know George Young did the bass on the whole of that album and um, I'm pretty sure, um, and there might be some research to be done on that, but Paul told me that he'd played bass on one or two of the songs and had felt quite upset when the album came out and he noticed that... He didn't seem to mind that George had played um, bass on the rest of the album, but I think he w seemed to lament that his bass hadn't been left on for the one or two songs that he played. And again, look, there are people, historians, who will know this way better than me. The album definitely is has none of Paul on it. It's all George, uh, pretty sure. A and people may say, no, nah, that's rubbish. He didn't even contribute at all. Um, so I'm not trying to make a big claim or anything. I'm just sharing my memories of what Paul and I chatted about. And he felt that he he really was disappointed that his uh, his bass playing wasn't on that album. Now, whether he was referring, and his memory wasn't quite strong on it, whether he was referring to demos, whether he was referring to um, just pre-production rehearsals, I'm not sure. I'd love to know more about that. I could be totally wrong. 
Another interesting little aside that um, I found from Noel Taylor, and Noel can correct me on this if I've misremembered, I'm pretty sure Noel had or has the first live ACDC recording ever made. Again, might be wrong. Let's check with Noel. He might watch this and write in the comments or something. <laughs> Um, and I might even correct some stuff in the comments later as well. But he, I'm pretty sure, had a, a cassette connected to the mixer of their very first gig in Sydney with him playing drums, different bass player, Angus and Malcolm, and the other guy singing. He was also an Evans, not the Mark Evans that replaced Paul. But a different Evan. You, you guys will know that better than me. And I do. I know it as well. I've just forgotten. So anyway, that's another little aside there. So getting back to Paul Matters and I in the shop, now sharing stories about ACDC, getting excited about playing for uh, this tribute program. And he was keen to, for just he and I to work out the songs, guitar and bass, and then to bring in the other guys. So that's why I don't know if I had a conversation with Noel about it. Um, I definitely had a conversation with Dan and Ben about it. And um, anyway, I very much enjoyed this time because he was excited and he was starting to share memories. So anyway, um, and I'll come back in a minute to his, my memory of him telling me how it all ended. Um, and, you know, memories, wow. I don't think they're even reliable eyewitness reports in court of law nowadays. <laughs> but anyway, one day we were playing, and we were, one, one thing I, that really struck me, hang on, excuse me. One thing that really struck me, <clears throat> the very first time <clears throat> we actually sat down, face to face, a couple of metres, a metre and a half, two metres apart from each other, and I started playing a riff that I'd written especially for, the, <laughs> for this festival. <laughs> and um, he said, oh, I like that. And he picked up a bass that was in my music shop and he picked up a bass off the um, hanging on the wall there. And, uh, boy, I hope this is recording. Just check. Seems to be. <laughs> anyway, when he started playing... Now, I remember I'd heard him play in Toronto in 1981, and I thought it was great. The band was great. But when you play music with someone, instead of listen to someone playing, there's a whole other thing that comes into play. There's a, a chemistry. There's a, a heightened sense of noticing what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> and wow, I, it really hit me as to why ACDC had asked him to join the band. He could play that bass guitar incredibly well with that special something, that X factor or N factor <laughs> that really makes some people stand out in the pack. They stand out above the pack. And I just remember getting goosebumps and thinking, whoa this guy can play not show off play but just play in the pocket play the right notes at the right time not get in the way but he could play and the other interesting thing I remember very clearly was his face lit up that first jam session <clears throat> it just lit up and that evil kind of <laughs> not evil but the bad boy kind of uh, look in his eye started twinkling and his smile just was bigger and he was just having a ball so anyway we we I don't know maybe every day for a few weeks jammed and jammed during the day between customers <coughs> and just chatted and um, I'd always wanted to ask him <coughs> why he had what had happened I hadn't really heard any of the rumours or the stories. Um, 
some ways it felt like a no-go conversation. But anyway, one day <clears throat> I felt comfortable enough to say, mate, what actually happened? <clears throat> How did you... <coughs> I'm talking too much, aren't I? <laughs> How did you get to the point where you left ACDC? Did you choose to leave? Were you kicked out? What happened? And I just remember this very long, somber silence <coughs> where I thought, <coughs> oh, excuse me, where I thought, oh, I've, I've crossed a line here. <coughs> I, I've kind of um, hit a nerve. So this is what I remember him saying because he, he did think for a while, but then he, then he started sharing his, his version of it. So keep in mind, this, this is his version, my memory telling my version, and it's a little bit different to others. I've heard um, others say that it was um, that Bon Scott came up to him, I think, at the in the back of the truck when they were loading equipment in, and there'd been a school gig that day, and Bon had said, "You're not coming back to Melbourne with us." And and so Paul just left. And there's some in my memory of the story. Uh, there's some key elements there that are correct. And in fact, maybe that is exactly what happened. There might be people that knew Paul better than me. I didn't know Paul that well. We, as I said, we just would cross paths. Um, but this particular time that we'd cross paths, I think I got a fairly in depth. There's a couple of parts about it that I'll talk about that I could be wrong on but <clears throat> my memory is he said that they'd played at Selena's that night in Sydney and he felt pissed off that Angus was wearing his school uniform and doing a big show and getting on the ground and spinning around playing his guitar. And so after the gig, he'd said to Angus, man, it's not about a show, it's about the music, man. And knowing Paul a little bit that I do, I can actually imagine him saying that. He could be very forward in his opinions and had no problem telling you exactly what he thought. I like that about him. So this rang, this rang true in my mind that, yeah, I can just imagine him telling Angus that, and I can just imagine him thinking that the school outfit, <laughs> this is kind of how he was telling me, oh, the school outfit and the spinning around on the ground, I'm like, dude, it's about the music. Stop showing off. And I, so I remember thinking, yeah, this rings true. And I also remember thinking, dude, you, you've missed the point of ACDC. It is a show and it is about the music. It is the two things blended at an exceptionally high level of skill. And if you were sitting there thinking that it should be just about the music and not about the show. And in fact, even that picture I showed you earlier, you can tell the others in the band have got that flamboyance. And he, as he, you know, he's got that look in his face like they all did. But he, he, he wasn't kind of buying into the outfits and the taking on the, the personas of school kids and stuff. So that hit me that yeah that story rings true and that um, people may have heard wrong or he may have explained it wrong about the being at the school that they played a school that day because of the school outfit maybe again I could be totally embarrassing myself here it's okay uh, because the ingredients of the story are true 
the, the fact that I think he did have a conversation like that with Angus. And I think that he probably shouldn't have had that conversation. <laughs> I think his world and life would have been totally different if Paul Mattis had just gone, yeah, I might put on a bit of a show as well. Make it about the music and the show. I reckon I can do that. But no, he didn't. He wanted the seriousness of the music to shine through without the show. So I, that rings true to me, and I might be wrong on the, the actual gig that day, but he definitely did not like the show. And I think he was mistaken to, to take that approach. <laughs> no, I'm not judging him. Good on him. That's his, you know, his total prerogative, prerogative to go, this is what I want to do. I want to be about the music. But um, it just seems to me that he was a bit misguided as to what the, the mission statement of ACDC was. <laughs> I mean, you know, just watch Bon Scott on stage. What's that famous um, clip where he's dressed like a girl on Countdown? Um, you know, him hamming it up on Long Way to the Top on the back of the truck in that video clip as well. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, so I might be wrong. Maybe there was a school gig that day. Some say that he didn't even play at that gig. But the essence is, and I think the key true ingredient is that he wasn't happy with the showing off and he was a bit blunt in telling Angus and he was um, a bit misguided in thinking that the ingredient of showing off in ACDC melded with the incredible seriousness of the music not the seriousness of lyrics or the complexity, but the seriousness of tone, arrangement, tightness of playing together as a band. ACDC are masters of that, you know. I don't think many people can pull off that kind of simplicity. <laughs> so the other part of that story about it being at the truck, he told me, again, my memory tells me that he told me, that he was in back at the hotel that room, room that night after the Selena's gig and Bon Scott came to the door and said, mate, you are not coming to Melbourne with us and uh, here's a train ticket back to Woi Woi or money for a train ticket back to Woi Woi. I know he mentioned Woi Woi, uh, which is kind of a town just north of Sydney right on the, water, the, the, um, the river there, the Hawkesbury River. And he said, we will send up your equipment later. And then he went and Paul Matters said that he went. Now, I don't know if he meant straight away or if he slept in the hotel. Again, these are details. I could be wrong. He, Von Scott could have come to the back of the truck as they were packing up and saying, mate, you're out of here. Here's the ticket. And Paul just took the ticket and went. So it may not have been hotel. That's not even a really key ingredient there. It may well have been the back of a truck. But that's that's the story. And I think it holds some essence and ingredients in there that do ring true. And I even said to Paul, I said, Dude, you don't tell Angus not to wear a school outfit and not to spin around on his back. That's that's what Angus does. And I remember him sitting there looking at me. I don't think anyone had challenged him on that before. And he went, anyway, that's the past. Something like that. And maybe I shouldn't have said that to him because over the next few days he began to lose interest in this idea. So maybe I shot myself in the foot like he had shot himself in the foot. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but he was also starting to get very nervous about the idea of playing again at such a big event. And I know that he was showing signs of anxiety 
with that concept. So when he, a few weeks later, said, mate, I'm, I'm out, I'm done, I'm not going to do it, I can't do it, um, I, I thought, yeah, okay. Damn. <laughs> um, I, st I still tried to keep that little dream alive. Um, in fact, if you go on uh, Spotify or Apple Music or somewhere there, you can hear a, a kind of mellow versions of the songs that we'd been kind of some of the cup two two of the songs I think on an EP by a, a kind of a group name I came up with last minute that really is silly called I think Sonic Cowboys and uh, if you're interested you can check that out on Spotify or Apple Music and um, I remember Felix Rizhevek who's a good friend of mine um, got him in to play bass I don't know if I ever contacted Noel I, I vaguely remember having a conversation with him about it and him being reasonably interested but we just didn't kind of I, I'd had the wind kicked out of my sails a bit I guess and uh, Blake Robinson played drums he's a local musician as well and I do remember us having a really fantastic jam session one night with Dan Spillane on vocals and um, myself on guitar, Ben Dalton on guitar, Felix on bass and Blake on drums and it just being very special. It was I wish we'd recorded the jam session. It was very special. Because I, I guess I thought, yeah, we, hey, we still might be able to... <laughs> Um, to get in to this festival and um, it was interesting because for some reason it didn't happen but I've got an idea that maybe that year the whole thing didn't happen everything just collapsed caved in and um, and I remember still keeping in touch with Paul on very friendly terms we didn't have a falling out so um, in some ways he might have even um, been fine with me telling him my point of view on that because it definitely didn't affect our friendship. And um, But I remember from that point on, he I never heard of him doing any music again after that. This is when he kind of became a bit more reclusive. I think he started to have some health problems. I don't think he ever had any kind of depression. Um, and his anxiety that I referred to seemed to be more um, more nervousness than like a, a depression. I think he had regrets always about what had happened. And... But like I say, he, he, he wasn't a depressed kind of person. He wasn't a, a victim. He wasn't a down-in-the-mouth, poor-me kind of guy. He was able to balance this kind of twinkle in his, in his eye and smile and joy for life along with this kind of bit of a regret. Because <laughs> let's face it, ACDC went on to be massive, massive. And Mark Evans took over from um, from Paul and played on several of their classic albums. There's some great YouTube clips of him playing with them in London with Bon Scott singing. And I don't know the story there. I think uh, Mark Evans has written a book, which I'm dying to read and I haven't read. I'd love to read that. Um, and find out a bit more. I have spoken to Mark a couple of times. I, I don't think he would know me from a bar of soap, but he works at that music shop. Is it Downtown Music in Sydney? Used to work there. There's plenty of information online about Mark. Great musician, great guy. And um, I don't know what happened there because he, I think, 
in many ways, that's my favourite lineup. Phil Rudd, Malcolm and Angus, Bon Scott, Mark Evans. You go and look up that YouTube clip of um, them playing at this live gig. It's just amazing. Amazing. Bon Scott is on fire. And we know the rest, of course, you know, um, Mark uh, Bon sadly died. The band, I think Mark had left the band by then. The band rallied. They're a very private band. Totally respect that. I love ACDC. I've got no criticism of ACDC. You know, they did what they did. If members weren't exactly what they needed, that, that was it. And I think after that, um, I think Cliff Williams came in, and of course, um, Brian, and Back in Black was recorded. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, I think Mark went on to maybe play with Rose Tattoo. Tiny little interesting aside from that is I eventually sold my music shop around 2014 to Di Pritchard, who is the lead guitarist for Rose Tattoo. He and his then partner, Leanna Rose, who's a wonderful country music, country rock singer. She's got some great material out there too. Di has got a great album as well, solo album, Di Pritchard. Um, but just some interesting connections there. He um, he certainly uh, has been a, a real um, key figure in um, you know Rose Tattoo over the last 15, 20 years. And by all accounts, uh, he eventually he was kind of wanting to wind down. Uh, he felt that Angry Anderson may be coming to a point of retirement soon. Um, so he bought the shop and was going to just teach guitar and kind of wind down a little bit. And uh, about two years later, Angry's doing more gigs than ever. Europe getting um, do, booking them. And they're doing these big shows again. And uh, good on him, Angry Anderson, you know, whoa. And Di Pritchard, incredible musicians. And uh, Angry Anderson's voice is amazing. So this kind of uh, Oz Rock era, you know, that um, the Angels and Rose Tattoo and ACDC, and I won't start listening because there's a long list of incredible music that was produced you know, 73, 74, and uh, I guess that Aussie pub scene went, you know, at least for a decade or so, and uh, and still still going strong in many ways. <coughs> uh, I saw the Angels before COVID hit, and Rose Tattoo on the same bill at the Doilo, and wow, amazing, just the Brewster brothers. And uh, brilliant night. I was front standing there right in front row. My sex, brilliant. These guys are touring and playing. Check them out online. Buy their stuff. Go and um, see their live shows if you get the opportunity. And so uh, as for me, you know, I, uh, I can't even look back and go, well, I, I at least had this moment in the sun <laughs> but it's okay I uh, I didn't even set out really in any way to to do anything more than just to make a living at, at playing music and um, and yeah well during COVID music has stopped <clears throat> but um, I've had a brilliant time I, I'd say I've probably been semi professional throughout the late 80s um, my my main income really has been music since 1993 and uh, I've had the pleasure of playing uh, with my band the Outback Hippies and we were support act for status quo for a few gigs in the uh, early 2000s brilliant 
memories playing at the entertainment center in Brisbane and Newcastle and uh, you know hanging out with Francis Rossi and Rick Parfitt my idols of when I was a teenager and uh, I've survived and I've had a great time and uh, I've got two gorgeous little girls started late in life because I was just out there traveling and playing music and um, I got to meet interesting people like I've shared in this video and people like Paul Matters and um, it was a real honor knowing knowing Paul and my life is better for having known him and as I said right at the start the whole reason of that I've done this video is to pay tribute to him someone who's a lesser known uh, character in the ACDC story but someone that um, had a positive impact on on everyone that he met and someone that I think should should have a little bit more said about him and so if people have got stories to share like I said Rod hopefully doesn't mind me saying go and check out Rod's um, Facebook page Rod Westcombe W-E-S-C-O-M-B-E -E. I'm sure he wouldn't mind if you go and check out some stuff that he's put there with some photos and um, yeah you know people like Steve Cowley and Dan Spillane and Noel Taylor and Di Pritchard and Felix Rijavec and um, you know I don't want to forget names that I've just been talking about Ben Dalton and um of course, you know, your, your Mark Evans. And, um, yeah, um, Blake, Blake Robinson, who um, has gone on to do a lot of soundtracks for Star Wars movies and games. It's just, you know, if you're a muser, you just live this incredibly interesting life. And Paul Matters was one of those interesting people that led an interesting life and so Paul Matters thanks for the, the music thanks for our friendship and um, you know looking back I wish I could have been there more for you and uh, may you rest in peace and I will always wish that that night uh, one week ago just really, you know, only a couple of days before you passed, I wish I'd stopped and uh, and just said hello. How you doing? <laughs> so um, thanks everyone for listening. I hope it's been a little bit interesting and informative. Let me just quickly just check my um, little list of things here that I was going to look at if I needed to. But I think, yeah, Paul, um, 1975, we established that. Um, someone has said that he was known as the band's pretty boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Um, some other great photos there. Uh, yeah, the Mark Evans, a uh, little bit there. And one of the comments here that matters kind of then slipped into relative obscurity. And only ever gave one interview to the press about his time in the band. Uh, I'd love to track that down. That'd be interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly feel like I had lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews with him. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's uh, some quotes here from uh, from Rod Westcombe as well. Um, but I think you can find him on his page there. He, he, they met in 1973. And... Um, and Rod said uh, when I was living in Toronto, he would drop into the house in the late hours to party, and he loved to party. <laughs> and maybe, Rod, this was your house that, that I was talking about in 1981 that I, I, you know, <laughs> picked up Paul as the hitchhiker and drove in. Maybe, maybe, let me know. And um, uh, I think Rod mentions that they even played in a band together after um, Paul had left ACDC and uh, he, I think he recounts here that 
um, they played together in a one-off band. <laughs> so I guess one gig, does that mean? Um, called Miss Australia Band um, on a ferry on Lake Macquarie. Now, that's... That ferry would is a famous gig to get. I remember once doing a gig on that ferry as well, once or twice, uh, where you'd you'd sit up <laughs> on this ferry, they'd travel around the lake, and you just rock it up. Toronto is actually a really hard town. Uh, I I remember um, a quote from the Bee Gees. One of the one of the guys in the Bee Gees said that Newcastle, Australia, and New South Wales was the hardest audience to win over but when they were won over they were the best audience in the world and I'd agree with that and I would say that Toronto is the hardest subsection of Newcastle <laughs> it's kind of part of Newcastle in a way on the edges I would say that if you can win over a Toronto crowd it's even harder than winning over a Newcastle crowd I've I've done many gigs there on that uh, is at the Toronto pub on the hill with my form with my, the band still together with the Outback Hippies and um, yeah there's a few other interesting quotes there talking about Armageddon the drummer Les Gully um, told the ACDC biographer Jesse Fink that matters just didn't fit the ACDC group because he had strong opinions and sensitivity and just played what he liked. And you know, that kind of ties in a little bit with the story I shared earlier as well. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, some of the other uh, members there of Armageddon. But I think we've covered it all. And, um, yeah. yeah, so... Um, Thanks, everyone, for listening. And, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it. I couldn't sleep tonight. That's why I came out into my shed and thought, I've just got to get this off my chest. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please share, subscribe, click the like button, <laughs> all of that good stuff. And, um, yeah, I'm Peter Dixon and Paul Matters. Thank you for the music, the personality and uh, friendship that touched many lives. And I hope this inspires others to, to share their stories and memories of you as well. So, um, yeah, catch you later. <laughs>